In this lesson, we're going to learn how to name and draw alkenes and alkynes. Alkenes and alkynes are both unsaturated hydrocarbons, which means they are not bonded to the maximum number of atoms, and they contain multiple bonds. Alkenes are hydrocarbons that contain one or more double bonds, whereas alkynes are hydrocarbons that contain one or more triple bonds. This is going to give us the ability to add on atoms that are not already present in the molecule, and we'll see that a little bit later in the reactions. So the first thing you're do, going to do when you're naming an alkene or an alkyne is to identify the longest continuous chain that contains the double bond or the triple bond. It may not necessarily be the longest continuous chain, but that multiple bond needs to be part of the parent chain. Now the root of your name is going to indicate the number of carbons, just like it did with alkanes, but when you're naming compounds with double bonds or triple bonds, you're going to use ENE to indicate an alkene, which contains a double bond, and YNE to indicate an alkyne, which contains triple bonds. Now when we number, we want to number the main chain by starting at the end of the chain nearest the double or triple bond, giving the double bond the lowest possible carbon numbers. Now our name needs to indicate where that double bond is, so we're going to give the double bond a number and it's going to be the number of the carbon atom that precedes the double bond, or the number of that first carbon atom that is part of the double bond. So your suffix is going to end up being hyphen, number, hyphen, and the ending ene or yne, depending on if it's a double or a triple bond. Now just like you did when you had more than one alkyl group or substituent, we need to indicate if there's more than one multiple bond using those small prefixes, di or tri, before our ending that indicates the double bond. And then our last step is just to identify and number any substituents like you usually would with alkanes. All right, let's try this one. So our first step is to identify the longest continuous carbon chain. So we can see one, two, three, four, five, six. Our longest carbon chain containing the multiple bond is six carbons long, which is hex, hex for six. And if we, we now we need to number that carbon chain so that our multiple bond has the lowest possible carbon numbers. Now left to right, we can see that that double bond starts on carbon 4, and right to left, we can see that that double bond starts on carbon 2. So we're going to choose carbon 2, or the green numbers, because carbon 2 is the lowest compared to carbon 4. So our suffix is going to have a 2 to show where the double bond starts. And because it is a double bond, it is going to be ENE -E at the end. So our parent chain is hex2ene. Now we can see that we have a 1 carbon substituent here, 1 carbon being methyl. And that it's with our green numbering that we decided on. It starts on carbon 5. So it is a 5-methyl substituent, making the name of our compound 5-methyl-hex-2-ene. All right, but naming's only half the battle. We have to draw them as well. So we're going to look first at our root and see that hept means that it is 7 carbons long. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and it ends in en, so we know that it mu the parent chain must contain a double bond. Di tells us that there are two double bonds, and our numbers tell us where they are. They the first one starts at carbon 2, and we can number our carbons to see where that is. And our, so our first double bond starts at carbon 2, and our second double bond starts at carbon 5. There are no substituents indicated in our name, so we can fill everything else in with hydrogens. And remember, we can only have four bonds to each carbon. So carbon 2, for instance, is 
bond has three bonds to it already, so we can only have one other hydrogen as well as with carbon three. We need one more hydrogen on carbon five and one more on carbon six, and we now have hepta 25 diene Now you'll notice there's an A here, hepta 25 diene and that is usually associated with having one of those little prefixes. Now unlike the aliphatic hydrocarbons we've been talking about, aromatic hydrocarbons are unsaturated hydrocarbons that have a ring structure, but they have a special bonding arrangement that makes them incredibly stable. The aromatic hydrocarbons you're going to see are based on benzene. The formula for benzene is C6H6. It's a single carbon wing with ring with one hydrogen bound to each carbon atom see here that benzene looks like it has alternating single and double bonds. However, experimental evidence has shown that all of the bonds are identical in length and other properties as well. The double bonds are actually in resonance. It looks like from the structure on the left to the structure on the right that the double bonds are moving around. But they're actually, the electrons in the second bond of the double bond are actually delocalized or shared among all of the carbon atoms. And these structures are really very stable and they're not readily available for chemical reactions. There are two things we have to keep in mind for naming when we have an aromatic hydrocarbon. When the alkane chain is small, we look at the benzene ring as the parent molecule, and we name any alkyl groups or substituents coming off of the benzene ring, and we use the parent name benzene. But if the alkane chain is longer, then we name the benzene ring as any other substituent using the name phenyl and we just name the compound according to the rules for alkenes or alkenes or alkynes as we normally would. So in our naming example here, we can see that both alkyl groups are small, so we're going to use the parent name benzene, and we are going to name both of our alkyl groups as substituents. Now we have a two carbon chain, which is ethyl, and we have a one carbon chain, which is methyl, and we are going to number them just like we did with our cyclic hydrocarbons. So we are going to number one, two, three, four, five, six, and we are going to use the lowest possible combination of numbers for our substituents, giving our alphabetically first substituent a priority in the numbering. So in this case, we are going to end up with 1-ethyl, that's not an L, that's an L, 4-methyl-benzene. There we go. Now I have oct here, oops, I have oct, so that is going to indicate 8 carbons, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 4,6-diphenyl is indicating that I have two phenyl rings, so two benzene substituents off of carbons 4 and 6. So there we go. And now the 2-ene here is indicating that at carbon 2 I have a double bond. Now the only thing left is to fill in my hydrogen so that there's four bonds to each carbon. And there you have it, 4,6-diphenyl-octa-2-ene. Now, alkenes and alkynes are much better starting materials in organic chemistry than alkanes because they contain multiple bonds as functional groups. Now, functional groups are any group of atoms in a molecule that are, are responsible for characteristic chemical reactions. And the multiple bonds in alkenes and alkynes make them much more reactive than alkanes. For instance, if you remember, when we did substitution reactions with alkanes, bromine needed a catalyst. When we do our addition reactions with our alkenes and our alkynes, the addition of Br2 is not going to require a catalyst. Now I say addition reactions because we are not working with saturated hydrocarbons. We have areas, these double and triple bonds, where we can add more atoms on. We can take the atoms of one molecule and add them onto our hydrocarbon without losing hydrogen atoms. The first type of addition reaction that we're going to look at is halogenation, where 
a halogen, like bromine or chlorine gas, is added to a double or triple bond like the one in ethene here. So here, the chlorine gas is going to react with ethene so that the double bond between the carbon atoms is going to be replaced by single bonds with the chlorine atoms. We now have an alkyl halide where our chlorine atoms are added across the double bond. So in this case, we would have we have ethene reacting in a halogenation reaction into 1,2-dichloroethane. Hydrogenation is a similar principle, but instead of an addition reaction where our, our small molecule is a halogen being added across our multiple bond, we are instead going to add a molecule of hydrogen across our multiple bond. In a hydrogenation reaction, however, we require pressure and heat as a catalyst. This allows the electrons in our double bond to rearrange and add our two hydrogen atoms in single bonds so that we end up with an alkane, in this case ethene. Now in our halogenation and our hydrogenation, our small molecules were symmetrical, so they could add either way and we ended up with the same molecule. However, our, in hydrohalogenation, we are adding both a hydrogen and a fluorine. So the two atoms in our small molecule are unsymmetrical. So our hydrogen could add to this carbon or this carbon, and the same with our fluorine. It could add to this carbon or this carbon. In each case, we would end up with a different product. To decide where each atom will end up, we use something called Markovnikov's rule, which is sometimes stated as the rich get richer. This rule states that when a hydrogen halide, or even water as we'll see, is added to an alkene, the hydrogen atom generally ends up on the carbon that already had more hydrogen atoms to begin with. So the carbon that was already richer in hydrogen atoms ends up even richer in hydrogen atoms. So in this example, my hydrogen could either end up on carbon 1 or carbon 2. But because of Markovnikov's rule, I know that my hydrogen needs to end up on carbon 1 and my fluorine needs to end up on carbon 2 so that the carbon that was richer in hydrogen atoms stays richer. The fourth type of addition reaction I'd like to look at is hydration. Now when you hydrate something, you add water to it, and that's exactly what is happening in this addition reaction. We are adding a molecule of water across a double bond, or a triple bond. Now water, when you write out the structure kind of like this, you can see that we have a hydrogen atom and a hydroxyl group, or an OH group. Now the hydrogen atom is going to end up on one carbon and the hydroxide group is going to end up on the other carbon. And we're going to again use Markovnikov's rule to decide which part of the water molecule is going to end up on which group, uh, which carbon. Now we can see that carbon 1 has two hydrogens, whereas carbon 2 only has one hydrogen. So if we want the rich to get richer, we know that the hydrogen from our water molecule will end up on carbon 1, and the hydroxyl group or the OH group is going to end up on carbon 2. And now we have a new type of molecule, we have an alcohol. And we're going to learn how to name those a little bit later. Now other, other than the use of Markovnikov's rule, another really important thing that you need to remember for the hydration type of addition reaction is that you always need to write H2SO4 as a catalyst if you want to get full marks on your tests and quizzes. And that's just because the mechanism for this reaction needs acidic conditions in order to go forward. Now here are some textbook references. The naming of alkenes and alkynes are in your textbook on page 28 to 30, and the addition reactions are uh, page 96 to 98. It's really cool that we're starting to learn some more reactions because we can start to put them together uh, to do some organic synthesis, which is my favorite.